This is a session for building resilience in their uh, society after COVID-19. Um, we're very pleased to introduce um, our respective speakers. Um, Dr. Dita Sebesbach, the Deputy Director of the UNUAEHS. And Dr. Maiko Nishi is a Research Fellow at UNUIS. And myself is there Ken Kushi. I'm also from UNUIS, their academic director, as well as program, uh, academic program officer. I'm very delighted to uh, give the chance to organize a session in their respectable wider conf annual conference here. Um, this um, modality of their session is a little bit not really familiar. However, uh, this new uh, platform is really enable us to bring everybody together in the same place. Without delay, uh, I'd like to uh, explain the uh, organization of this session. We will uh, have three talk from each speaker, uh, started by me, um, on their uh, resilience sustainability and monitoring urban health metabolism by me. And the disaster, uh, and um, Nishi, Dr. Nishi Michael is talk about biodiversity. And Dr. Zita uh, will talk about the uh, disaster or disaster prevention, all related to COVID-19. So uh, let me start uh, my presentation first. And we are, we're gonna welcome their question and answer uh, after a talk of three people. And uh, you can you can put your question in Q1A a chat box, or uh, you can uh, lively ask question to us. Let me start. Okay, um, I start with a very classical uh, definition, not really classical, it is defined by Carl Folke, 2010, on uh, sustainability and resilience relationship. The sustainability is basically manage the resources in a way that guarantee welfare and promote equity in the current and future generations. It's important to see the resilience. Important things is retain essentially the same function, structure, and feedbacks. We have so we have something to retain. What do we want to retain? Let's say the society, actually society at large. In not, not only human, but also including the planet. planet. In order to uh, uh, have society, uh, the society is supported by various things. Economy is a, is a very typical one. Economy, good economy, supports society. And economy is also supported with various issues. And I listed here three uh, things here, landscape, biodiversity, disaster risk reduction. And these things is also supported with their uh, natural and human resources, <coughs> excuse me, as well as their technology and social systems. And these um, economy, natural human resources, or uh, these other system is subject to receive external forces, climate change, natural disaster, migration of people, other things, but we won't focus on COVID-19 here. And these kind of external forces is going to disturb their system. However, uh, it is very important to retain the function of the society we call resilience. <coughs> Our prosperity, current prosperity, is based on their stable climate, for last 20 or 15,000 years. This stability uh, created agriculture and current prosperity of the people is really uh, based on their assumption that the climate is stable. However, in Anthropocene, uh, we observe our activity, human activity is really changing the earth system or earth itself, our environment the carbon dioxide concentration, population itself, 
GDP, water use consumption, or these things is really putting a uh, pressure to the earth system. Then uh, now we are really seeing the boundary of the planet. COVID-19 is one of the greatest uh, pressure, external forces that we experienced uh, last 100 years. And still we don't know or when this uh, uh, pressure is going to finish. I, I, it's, this is one of the uh, issue that I'm proposing here is to utilize wastewater uh, to monitor urban metabolism for health risk. Wastewater include various things, but the very important things is wastewater has feces. Feces is a, a very good indicator in order to reflect the condition of the health, as well as their, uh, how people is getting infected or their pathogenic microorganisms or non-pathogenic microorganisms. This is an indicator of health on urban res residents or even animal as well. And uh, current or uh, recent uh, rapid development of molecular biological technique is really uh, tremendously uh, improved the detection and enumeration of pathogenic, pathogenic microorganisms. And we know that wastewater flows very quickly and it takes less than one day from the very upper stream of their city to the downstream. Usually the wastewater treatment plant is located in the very most downstream of their uh, entire sewer network system. So it takes only one day or less. In the case of Tokyo, it takes almost half a day. And since the wastewater is mixed and combined uh, and then finally, it detected in their uh, uh, sampling in their wastewater treatment plan, and then privacy is secured. As it, it is, we also know their uh, privacy is very important uh, for their under this COVID-19. We have uh, we can have observed a lot of discrimination uh, based on the disinfectious status. Uh, because of these things, and their uh, real infection may happen, you can see in the bottom uh, figure. Uh, however, the report from the hospital usually delay like two weeks because it takes some time people visit uh, hospital. It takes some time the hospital report to their authority and it takes some time authority uh, organize and gather and uh, report to the public. Um, it is getting better, is it getting better, uh, but it takes several days to, to several weeks. However, uh, we, uh, in the detection of the wastewater, uh, detection passage in wastewater, we really don't need to collect uh, the, the data from hospital. We just need to take sample uh, from the water and then just send to lab. And in a few hours, we have answer uh, from the machine. The technique that we use a PCL polymerase chain reaction that uh, you know we can use we are that we are using for detecting uh, our you know their, their their infection status of the people. Um, preparation for the uh, preventing outbreak, uh, as I explained, the like wastewater detection. The, we need to have real time data for the infectious risk. But at the same time, we need a very basic data uh, for social information, for economic information, in order to assess the vulnerability. Um, by knowing this, we know the intervention, how to pre uh, precaution behavior, or masks or vaccination, et cetera. Uh, then having this uh, action, then we can prepare a hospital for doctor nurses for vaccination, we can prepare the society for lockdown or lifestyle changes. And finally, uh, the result will bring the rest number of patients or zero number of patients or no outbreak. So oh, I would like to uh, propose that, you know, they're monitoring uh, people uh, is or urban environment for health risk is very important. Okay, I'll stop my presentation here. Thank you. 
And I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Maiko Nishi. Uh, she, has, she has a video presentation uh, pre-recorded. So I'd like to request organizer to play the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Maiko Nishi, a research fellow of UNU Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability, IAS. Within UNUIS, our program, Biodiversity and Society, has been engaged in policy-oriented research and capacity development on the issues of sustainable human-nature interactions. We have been also hosting the Secretariat of International Partnership for the Satoyama Initiative called IPSI. This is a global platform to facilitate collaboration on the management of production landscape and seascapes helping to meet the twin goals of conservation and development. Today, I'd like to share some thoughts about local communities and biodiversity uh, in the COVID-19 societies based on our studies and experiences, particularly working with the BPC partners. The ongoing pandemic has demonstrated the cascading effects of complex human nature interactions on human health and well-being. COVID-19 is said to be a zoonotic disease or an emerging infectious disease of probable animal origin. So currently, more than 70% of emerging diseases like Ebola, Zika, and almost all known pandemics have animal origin. So in this regard, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPES, convened a workshop last year on the links between biodiversity and pandemics. The report from this workshop says pandemics originate in diverse microbes carried by animal reservoirs, but the emergence is caused by human activities like land use change, agriculture expansion and intensification, and also wildlife trade and consumption. So these drivers bring wildlife, livestock and people into closer contact and allow animal microbes to move into people resulting in infections and sometimes outbreaks. And global pandemics are rare relative to small-scale outbreaks, but have been increasing under the exponential rise in consumption and trade, demographic pressure, and climate change. So human impacts on nature drive the emergence of diseases, but nature essentially support our life and well-being. So ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people support human well-being in many ways, uh, like food, water, timber, regulating climate, and also providing cultural values. And all of them are underpinned by biodiversity. And Millennium Ecosystem Assessment identify five major aspects of human well-being, um, including security, material needs, health, good social relations, and also freedom of choice and action. And among them are human health, are inclusive of physical, mental, and social well-being, is a central component of all these well-being constituents because health is affected by not only ecosystem change, but also the changes to the other aspects of well-being, like security and good social relations. And importantly, as Constanza and others pointed out, Ecosystem services can be provided by nature alone without human involvement because people, community, and built environment help nature to have meaning and values to humans. So in this context, to ensure and enhance sustainable human-nature interactions, we have been promoting the Satyam Initiative, and this is a global effort to realize societies in harmony with nature. And this initiative was developed based on the concept of socio-ecological production landscape and seascapes called sepals. Sepals are defined as areas where production activities like agriculture and forestry contribute not only well-being of local communities, but also biodiversity conservation and the provision of ecosystem services. And in order to implement the concept in practice, the International Partnership for the Satoyama Initiative, IPSI, was launched during the 10th Conference of the Party to the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD-COP10, held in Japan in 2010. 
So this is a platform to globally promote networking and also collaboration in managing CEPOs, particularly for sustainable use of biodiversity. And having started with 51 founding member organizations, this partnership now consists of about 280 organizations, including national and local governments, NGOs, private sector, academia, and indigenous peoples and local communities who are dedicated to work together to foster synergies in the implementation of their activities. So in order to facilitate the CEPOS management, we have been promoting the landscape approaches, uh, which are multi-stakeholder collaborative processes to balance diverse needs in a given area. This approach provides a useful framework of space-based strategies attending to specific local conditions and also the knowledge of local actors. In particular, it takes a realistic view to reconcile competing demands and needs among different stakeholders. So this allows for uh, minimizing trade-offs and maximizing synergies for more ethical and equitable decision making. And this approach also entails iterative learning processes involving diverse stakeholders. So it also facilitates resource mobilization and capacity development and also helps to adapt to changes and deal with uncertainties. So serving at the Secretariat of IPSI, uh, we have been collecting the case studies of CEPOS management from the member organizations. So far, we have collected 245 case studies. And among them, agriculture and forest ecosystems are dominant, but we also have cases of inland water, grassland, and coastal ecosystems. And to share and augment practical knowledge on the CEPOS management, uh, we have been archiving this case study in our website. And since 2015, uh, we have been publishing an annual series of case study compilation uh, on certain topics like transformative change and multiple values, and synthesize experiences, lessons learned from the underground management activities, and provide policy recommendations relevant to the international processes and also global goals. So we are still trying to learn more from the IPSI case studies about how the local communities are coping with the pandemic impact. But one case from the Philippines, for instance, suggests the community's capacity, uh, which has been strengthened through the CEPOS management, has also helped to deal with the pandemic challenges. So here, in the rural coastal community, mangrove restoration project has developed since 2009. It is a multi-stakeholder effort by a locally based farmers association local government units and also the National Department of Environment and Natural Resources. And this effort has been building climate change resilience by supporting livelihoods through the provision of food and fibers from mangroves, creating buffer zones minimizing the risk of flooding, and also empowering the community. And after the COVID-19 outbreak, um, it was reported that the pandemic impacts were felt minimum by local people. So here, the health in mangroves continuously provided food and livelihood resources. An old savings program developed through this initiative allowed people to manage their financial resources within the community even without travel. Also, the high degree of cooperation has helped to adhere to the protocols and orders by the government to prevent uh, disease spread. So the local community with high capacity of landscape and seascape management may better address new environmental and socioeconomic challenges. But we can't really guarantee that these communities can continuously sustain such a capacity and also overcome emerging challenges because the climate change impacts may be amplified and also the pandemic will occur more frequently if the current trends continue. So it should be important to keep monitoring and evaluating the community's capacity to reduce vulnerability and also strengthen the resilience. In this regard, the 
indicators of resilience in sepals would be a useful tool to have local communities better prepared for the future challenges. And this is a set of 20 indicators developed in cooperation with some of the EPC members to capture multiple dimensions of landscape and seascapes and also help communities to assess the resilience capacity on their own and develop community-based strategies in a participatory manner. And one of the 20 indicators also capture a health dimension and this would help to build the resilience of society after COVID-19, particularly from the local level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm very happy now there to, to invite doc, Dr. Zeter Sibisbury uh, for the third and final talk for this session. Now floor is yours, Dita. Thank you very much. So um, welcome to everyone. Um, I have a pleasure to talk today about uh, COVID-19 and impacts uh, and solutions in the context of disaster risk. And um, uh, in fact, we just today launched uh, a new report, which is called Disaster Risk in an Interconnected World. Um, this was launched uh, today in, in the morning hours and uh, uh, reaching now um, uh, a lot of media attention. Uh, we are very proud to, to um, have the opportunity to be here also today at the wider conference and share with you um, uh, our thinking around compounding disaster risks. So what we did, we looked back at 2020, 2021 and selected 10 events including COVID-19, which um, are uh, um, emblematic, so to say, for a certain type of uh, disasters uh, in that year. So as you see, we selected different ones like the Amazon wildfires. 2021 was really a uh, large wildfire years, a lot of um, wildfires going on. Uh, there was a heat wave in the Arctic. Um, you might may remember the Beirut explosion, the blast um, happened in August 2020. Um, the flood flooding in central Vietnam, where just within seven weeks, uh, nine storms and cyclones hit the Vietnamese coast. Then um, the Chinese puddle fish uh, was uh, declared extinct in 2020. That was a beautiful, huge uh, fish um, of seven meter length, um, which is not uh, with us anymore, although it was older than the dinosaurs. Um, we also had the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Cyclone Amphan, which hit uh, the border area between uh, um, Bangladesh and uh, India. There was a desert locust outbreak um, in, uh, which impacted uh, 23 countries, mainly in, in Eastern Africa, but uh, also uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula and behind. Uh, there was a, a mass beaching event in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And finally, in February 2021, there was a, a huge cold week um, which impacted uh, the US state Texas. So our idea was to look at these events because uh, more and more events are happening. They are coming every day. Uh, you, you hear them, you read them uh, in the media, um, you watch them on the television. And even for people like us who are actually working um, in the field of disaster risk reduction, it's getting more and more challenging to, to keep space with all these changes and the next disaster. So you just catch up on, the, on, on one and, um, and the next day, the next one is happening like we just had the flash floods in New York and um, then um, now there's a um, um, earthquake uh, in Mexico and who knows what is happening tomorrow. So the idea was to select 10 events and look, look at them. How are they interconnected? Uh, what are the underlying patterns and what we can learn for better solutions? So uh, for this session, I would like to highlight specifically the COVID-19 and um, how um, the pandemics actually interacted with almost all other disasters which happened in 2020-2021. So um, some of the disasters um, led to spiking numbers of COVID-19 incidences, such as the Texas cold wave, the Beirut explosion and also cyclone Amphan in Bangladesh and India. Uh, for example, for the Texas cold wave, um, um, many um, 
so there was a, a power cut uh, which impacted uh, millions of people and uh, some of the hospitals were already full uh, before the cold wave, cold wave came because because of uh, the pandemics so those people um, has been, has been sent home with plug-in breathing uh, uh, instruments uh, and uh, then um, uh, the power cut came due to the cold wave. So uh, many people actually suffered um, adverse health impacts or even lost their lives. But there are also um, impacts uh, other way around. Um, so um, because of the pandemics, uh, many people suffered increased financial vulnerability. And uh, then um, when a disaster strike, they, they were harder impacted or there was a reduced effectiveness of disaster response because of the pandemic situation uh, or a disruption of supply chains for necessary goods. And I will give you now some examples so that you can better understand. So for example, increased financial vulnerability, I would like to give you the example of the Cyclone Amfan, which hit in May 2020, this border area between West Bengal, India and, um, and Bangladesh. So people were already um, struggling with the impacts of, uh, of COVID, with the lockdown. Many people lost their livelihoods in the cities and then uh, came back to this more rural area. And uh, they were actually quarantining in uh, cyclone shelters. So at the time um, the cyclone hit, the shelters were already full. Um, altogether, around 4 million people have been evacuated from their homes and um, there was not enough capacity left in the cyclone shelters to, to house them. Um, one example for uh, how actually the pandemics contributed to reduced effectiveness of disaster response um, is um, uh, the Texas cold wave, um, where um, basically um, the hospital capacities uh, were not enough, so to say, to, to cope uh, with these uh, two different uh, impacts. More than 200 people died because of um, the cold wave, so mainly because of hypertherma, but also because uh, of insufficient uh, um, air um, so to say, supply uh, due, due to uh, due to power cuts. In other cases, such as um, in the desert locust outbreak, uh, basically um, the COVID pandemics and the lockdown uh, contributed for experts not being able to go uh, to the infected area. Uh, or they arrived too late, but also necessary goods such as uh, pesticides, which uh, which could not be supplied because uh, due to the lockdowns, uh, the supply chains were interrupted. So this shows um, um, that actually there was a lot of interaction between COVID and other disasters uh, and the interaction was mutual. So some of the disasters led to spiking COVID numbers and on the other hand, uh, COVID uh, made uh, some of the disasters more severe and their impacts more lasting. So um, when we are talking about solutions, um, we are using basically in this report, the interconnectivity we are showing between the disasters to our advantage. And um, here there's a lot of uh, similarity actually uh, between this uh, thinking and this presentation and between um, the presentation you heard uh, before from co colleagues from IES. So if we look um, at the emerging crisis um, or it's actually more than emerging. We do have the climate crisis. We do have the biodiversity crisis and we have increasing changes in terms of uh, reducing disaster risk. Um, we do see actions um, which uh, aim to reduce uh, the adverse impacts in one sphere, such as applying, for example, a large amount of pesticides uh, to uh, combat the desert locust outbreak. Um, however, uh, those kind of pesticides uh, really harm uh, biodiversity, non-target species, but also livestock and uh, also impact human health. So what we are saying is that there are actually 
opportunities to combat uh, the desert low cost uh, in a way that we are not harming biodiversity if we do actions much earlier at the time the low cost worms are not that large yet and also using pesticide which is more environmentally friendly. The second example on the right hand side you see um, we show that also um, some of the actions we are taking may be beneficial to to two out of three um, of these uh, spheres uh, while still impacting negatively the third one. So, for example, um, in the case of paddlefish, the, the Chinese paddlefish went extinct mainly because of dam construction on the Yangtze River. Um, so with dam construction, uh, we do contribute to, um, to tackling um, uh, the climate crisis uh, because it's a renewable energy. Them so as to contribute to disaster risk reduction uh, in terms of flood risk reduction, but also drought reduction. But of course, they fragment rivers, um, separate fishes from their spawning grounds, from their habitats. And uh, in this case, it's even led to uh, the extinction of a species. So what we are showing in the report that there are actually also solutions which are more integrative, uh, which pay attention, so to say, to the other spheres and um, do no harm. And one of those are um, nature-based solutions, which are, uh, with nature-based solutions, we mean uh, action which uh, restore or protect uh, nature in order to help people to adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change or to reduce disaster risk. For example, here I'm using the example of Cyclone Amphan. Um, the Shundarban, which is a, a world largest mangrove forest um, in that very area where the Amphan uh, cyclone hit, um, provides protection, kind of a shield um, for communities beyond, uh, behind um, the forest. Um, while it's breaking um, the wind speed, it's breaking waves and um, uh, help to minimize the impacts, uh, to minder the impacts of, um, of storms and cyclones. However, we are losing um, the Schunderbans uh, due to for example, uh, coastal erosion, but also land conversion. Um, so protecting and also reforesting uh, the Schunderbans and similar ecosystems worldwide could help us to not only tackle disaster risk, but to also save biodiversity and address the climate crisis as the forest still sequester carbon. And finally, um, a last example for an integrative solution are so-called adaptive social protection solutions. Um, social protection systems are usually designed in a way that they um, help to reduce individual risk. So people who suffer unemployment, sickness, um, or disability or, or death in the family, um, the, uh, through risk pooling, adaptive social systems can um, help uh, to um, increase resilience. However, these social protection systems are not designed in a way that they could also address the impacts of disasters or um, the adverse impacts of climate change. Um, if you imagine an area where um, a flood flooding is happening, and for example, um, there's a factory which is impacted, um, the employees cannot come uh, to work because the factory might have uh, had to stop uh, working due to the flooding. So just imagine a social protection system which is spe specifically designed um, to tackle those kind of challenges and to provide temporary help um, for people who cannot continue working uh, due to flooding. So with that, I would like to close and um, I am looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, thank you, Dieter. Um, now we finished the three presentation there and we can have a 10 minutes uh, left and we can uh, proceed for discussion. There's one comment from the director of IAS there uh, to the Dieter, um, talking about uh, uh, both nature best solution and adaptive social protection is very important. Uh, she agreed with that. And um, we, wait, we wait for the uh, Q&A uh, from our question. Um, let's see, the solution requires. 
there are the question uh, from uh, Dr. Yamaguchi is there uh, at the same time there this solution requires intensive awareness raising. Do you have any opinion on this? This is I think question to Zita. Do you want to have a quick answer for this? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I very much uh, share uh, that opinion and um, this is why we uh, set out at UNUHS to uh, design a science-based media report to raise awareness for um, this interconnectivity and to highlight that we actually can um, make this interconnectivity, can work um, with this interconnectivity to our advantage. To, so seeing the interconnectivity as one means to design better solutions. And um, the idea is to um, to publish this report um, every year. And the idea is to write it in a very accessible way so that um, uh, the general public and also media can um, understand and, and take up the messages uh, mm -hmm. we would like to convey. And it comes with um, with uh, scientific te technical uh, backup uh, documentation. So for each and every um, event, we do have also a, a technical report which can be downloaded. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have a one question to Michael-san. Uh, that uh, uh, you, you, your presentation having a uh, kind of their uh, you know uh, biological uh, issue and you know, climate kind of their you know interaction and of course you know the disaster I mean the uh, uh, infection and you know the, the the biodiversity and you know in the previously um, you know there are several uh, uh, upcoming there uh, diseases like uh, SARS or Mars or, or AIDS or you know their COVID-19 self is there uh, having uh, no really scientific proof proven yet but it, it has some interrelationship between human and then natural natural I mean animals you know and there uh, in wild animal and and by in 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 a way the Satoyama is a kind of front line the interface between their nature and human and what is there do you think I'm changing a question in the past, in the past but the, what, what do you think in their proper relationship with a human and their and you know their uh, uh, bi 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 biological system in their uh, a little bit more wild yeah thank you very much for the question I think it's really critical question and I think it hasn't been uh, scientifically actually proved and of course, I think so far, uh, the landscape approach and landscape people are looking at them, how the positive aspects, uh, like benefits uh, arising from the uh, human nature interaction. But I think uh, particularly the COVID-19 and pandemic show that are kind of a um, very critical nexus trade-offs mm -hmm. uh, we have in having or suffering from the our kind of our interaction with nature and mm -hmm. so um so to that extent uh how and also how we should actually interact with nature is actually a big question and for example uh, uh, in order to kind of protect the biodiversity uh like a protected area is a mainstay of the mm -hmm. kind of a policy tool and of course, um, there are also arguments uh, like uh, we should we really reserve some kind of area for biodiversity conservation. But at the same time, we need to also think about the livelihoods. So we can really kind of dedicate uh, as much as lands for only for the nature conservation. So I think there should be some balance. And also uh, in that way, I think uh, we need to kind of consider multiple needs and also demands for the natural resources. But uh, at the same time, we need some our scientific evidence or empirical evidence and also scientific reasoning. But also at the same time, we need to have some local wisdom. So such kind of uh, interaction and communication uh, probably will be the key to kind of a uh, device as uh, strategies to wisely uh, manage the landscape and also the nature. Mm. All right, thank you very much. I want question to Zita. Actually, this is kind of their echoing their question from the Yume Yamaguchi that there, I have mentioned about you know a lot of interrelationship, interconnectivity of the various different sectors uh, from the uh, viewpoint of their disaster. But there, you know, these each sector having a 
you know, different language in other world, you know. So how, what, 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 do you have any like idea in order to encourage communication of different sec, like financial sector or, or governmental sector or, you know, they're, they're, they're vulnerable people in the Bangladesh, you know. I mean, they, they have to work together in order to have a synergistic effect, you know. Um, you analyze it, but the intervention have to be, have to be done uh, at the same time with their all stakeholders. Uh, do, how we can kind of stimulate their discussion with their with different stakeholders? Um, do you have any, I mean, their experience or idea for this? I can take one example in your your four four example, three example that you have shown. You know. Yes. Um, well, um, I, I think, I mean, the, the report was more um, uh, an analysis and, um, and suggestion for so solutions. But of course, um, in other type of work, um, we are also involved in, we, we do have a lot of experience with bringing together different stakeholders. And I think um, the most important is to to try to find joint objectives. So um, mm -hmm. what could be, so to say, joint benefits of those different sectors or, or of mm -hmm. those different stakeholders mm -hmm. and why they should come together in the first place, right? And mm -hmm. um, once uh, uh, we manage to, to get the right people uh, together coming from different angle and uh, really working out together what is the joint um, goal they can uh, contribute from their specific angle. Um, mm. It's hard work, I, I agree with you, but um, I feel we do not have too much of a choice at this stage um, because we are, um, yeah, the clock is ticking. I think the sixth um, IPCC assessment report is also a strong reminder yeah. and what is currently ongoing uh, in the CBD process also yeah. shows us that there's not much time to lose. Um, and um, mm. the sense of urgency, I think more and more people actually understand uh, the sense of urgency for our action. True. Actually, there I was also thinking the same way. The COP twenty six. You know how there this IPCC assessment report six influence to their discussion or stimulate in their uh, in the, the COP sixteen at twenty six. Yeah, as you said, it it giving us kind of same objective, kind of same kind of view. So it will probably stimulate their their the discussion in the COP twenty six. Let's see what happened in COP twenty six. Unfortunately, COP15 is postponed. So we can see that their discussion in the next year. It's it's time is all, we have only one minute. Uh, do you have any final uh, statement, 30 second statement, uh, Dr. Nishi? Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, we are still working uh, on the, like uh, synthesizing the, the findings from the local cases. So hope to kind of also share uh, our kind of finding from the local kind of uh, the case studies, how the local communities are coping with the pandemic. So mm. we are looking forward to sharing more with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. How about you, Zita? Yeah, maybe I would like to highlight because there's a new nature publication highlighting um, mm. the success of the Montreal Protocol to um, to uh, um, for the benefit of uh, oz our ozone layer, so to say. And I think it's important to highlight success stories uh, because that was a story mm. where international cooperation and agreements mm. um, actually uh, mm. uh, made a, a, a real difference. And this recent nature paper um, uh, calculates how much temperature increase we actually would have got if we do not um, set up the Montreal Protocol. And um, the outcome of the, that paper is that it, we would be now at 2.5 degrees Celsius mm. um, um, uh, global warming. So I think, um, uh, highlighting that we really read something there and um, that it's possible to do it again um, would be my closing remark. Thank you very much. I think there uh, through this uh, session we really saw uh, having found that in academic academia is actually easier. We represent sometimes in the different sectors, but in academia we have more, much easier uh, discussion. Uh, so I would like to uh, propose that academic people would be the kind of glue or stimulator or catalyst, catalyst, you know, in order to stimulate the discussion in among different sectors.
Um, I'm sorry to say we, we have one minute passed, but I confirmed it from their, I mean, their uh, organizers, you know, we, they don't force to close the session. So we'd like to officially thank, uh, close this session by thanking to all speakers and audiences. Thank you very much.